globally, how do we grow this influence of, of uh, black leaders, uh, men and women that can represent our industry inside the ANC, inside the, the policy making structures? Get uh, to grips with the, the digital environment, uh, put together best practices, what works and what doesn't, very importantly. In the project that we're doing in Chat Labs, we've created a, a linking bridge between those uh, those two little areas there. So it becomes a matter of just 10 minutes walk from one side to the other. So my message to our CEOs and those chief investment officers is where at the end of the day do you want to see your role? So by feeding all of our water back to a stage where we can bring it back into the process, we're in effect saving around about 35% of, uh, of our water usage on site. Welcome to GreenEconomy.tv. I'm your host and facilitator, Byron McDonald. Today, we have a special guest on The Circular Show. That is Benoit Leroy, CEO of South African Chamber, of course. He will be going in conversation with Gordon Brown, publisher of Green Economy Journal, and Chris White, director of the African Circular Economy Network. And how can we forget? Nawazi, the intelligent Nawazi Mbele. But before I go ahead, as I say each show, GreenEconomy.tv provide insight and intelligence on all sustainability-related matters. So let's invite on our guest. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Hello, Baron. Good, good. I, I see Gordon has just popped on, so I'll give it over to him from this side. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Byron, and uh, a warm welcome to Nawazi, to Chris, and to Benoit, our special guest today. Uh, so from my side, Gordon Brown, quick introduction. I'm the publisher of Green Economy Journal. Uh, we're the producers of greeneconomy.tv, and today we're running, I think it's the fifth or sixth edition of Circular Economy, and I'll focus on that subject. Special guest, uh, guest uh, Chris White, uh, who joins us from the African uh, Circular Economy Network, as always, to, to lead the thinking on the topic. Uh, and our special guest, uh, uh, Benoit Leroux from the SA Water Chamber. Uh, and we're joined, of course, as always, by my colleague, Nawazi, who represents the youth with her uh, young and curious mind, uh, and, and speaks on, on, behalf, on behalf of all of her colleagues at, uh, at tertiary education, where she's studying uh, 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 environmental management. I think it's at uh, Cape uh, Peninsula Technology School of Technology. So, so welcome to all of you. Now, as we kick off, uh, I just like to. Uh, I've given you my quick introduction. I'd like to just do a quick uh, a round of introductions for everybody, just so that viewers know exactly who we're talking to today. And ladies first, Nawazi, if you can just give us a, your quick intro, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Uno Um I'm a, currently a fourth year student at CPUT studying environmental management. And yeah, I'm going to learn a lot today also. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chris, over to you. Hi, everyone. Chris White, uh, Director of the African Circular Economy Network and uh, Specialist in Circular Economy Applications across Africa. Thank you very, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Benoit Leroy, over to you, please, for a brief intro. Uh, yes, Benoit Leroy, thanks for inviting me. Uh, Co-founder and CEO of the South African Water Chamber, passionate about water, waste and energy nexus. Oh, what a pleasure. And, uh, so over the past uh, few uh, episodes of, of this particular series, uh, we started off with a big picture. Uh, we had Chris White explain to us, you know, what, what the term circular, uh, circular economy means, uh, how it's positioned worldwide, how it's positioned in South Africa. And since then, we've had a number of conversations looking very specifically at how the principles and the thinking uh, around circular economy can be applied in specific sectors. Um, this week, we're focused on the water sector. Uh, it's, a, it's a super important sector in our country. Uh, we're, a, we're a water scarce country. I mean, uh, I, for my part, based in Cape Town, have just lived through some of the worst droughts that we've, that we've experienced in living memory. 
and so really it's about how do we use water better uh how do we how do we store water better how do we secure water better how do we transport it better and and ultimately for industry certainly now how do we use it better in, in a in a more circular way so I, i'd like to open the conversation by bringing chris in and say uh, chris perhaps you could just give us a good sense of uh, perhaps the problem statement that exists in the water sector in South Africa, and I know that that's quite specific uh, to, to sub-sectors and, and uh, within the sector, but give us a sense of, of how you see the problem, uh, uh, the problem statement, and then perhaps give us some sense of how circular thinking uh, can really be brought in to, to shift us towards solutions. Sure. Thank you, Gordon. Um, obviously, we've been going through the different elements of circular economy, and, and I think we've made it very clear from the onset that circular economy is not just something about recycling. It's not a buzzword for recycling or waste. It's more about looking at a multi-sectoral approach to understanding all the different elements um, that, that uh, can be uh, developed through the, the application of circular economy principles. So, We've discussed some of those. We've gone into a little bit of detail on uh, very, very detailed on fruit and veg and looking at the agricultural sector. We've looked at energy um, and water is a key one. Uh, water, as we all know, we, we live in a water scarce country uh, and we have to be pretty um, tight in terms of our control and management of the water. And before the chat, we had a, a little get together, a little natter with uh, with Benoit and, and he, he stated very clearly that that water is something that's always been circular. I mean, the, the entire water cycle is a circular system. However, mankind has interjected on that circular system um, and we have utilized, overutilized and abused the resources that we have available. So we really need to take on circular economy principles to look at the management and development and appropriate utilization of the water resources that we have. So perhaps we can kick off with, uh, with Benoit and in terms of looking and understanding um, where we are uh, as a country in terms of something like the, the water and sanitation master plan and the opportunities for a circular economy from there. Benoit? Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so let, if, if we start with the master plan, it's, it's done on the premise that our water for more than a decade is fully allocated and that was with the normal rainfall and water cycle prior to uh, let's say global climate change which has made everything stochastic so un un unpredictable and so our water is is mostly over allocated in most of the catchment areas very few under allocated but in reality we don't have a current mass balance because our, me our hydrological measurement systems are not fully functional and um, I, I think, you know, we're not going to harp on that. It's an ongoing theme across all sectors at the moment. So with the water fully allocated and with the population that's increased by 30, 40 percent over that period of time, let's say of two, two decades, we are forced to be more circular. We have to make more use of what we have. And the master plan that we fought a lot about, many criticize saying it's not complete. It's there. It's a work in progress. We've got something to work with. You can't have strategies if you don't have a plan. So we know what we've got to do. And the first thing is we've got to drive efficiencies with our resource. So it's reduce. And it sounds familiar to the waste hierarchy is we have to reduce our footprint without starving industry because deindustrialization has to be turned around. We don't want to increase that. So the first thing is to reduce and 41% of our water is. Right. Uh, have we lost Benoit there? It looks like we have lost him. Okay. Yeah, I've been struggling with my with my own technical challenges, and so I wasn't even I wasn't sure if I disappeared or or Benoit disappeared. But so uh, let's let's give him one second uh, to see if he comes back. But perhaps uh, Chris, just picking up on uh, that water and sanitation master plan that Benoit is talking about. Uh, perhaps just give us a, a little bit of background about that so that we, we have a little bit more context to, to the conversation. Well, in essence, it, it's been uh, certainly not unknown that we have issues and restrictions in terms of water uh, and particularly wastewater treatment. 
Um, and this has been raised through the water sector. We have uh, many highly qualified engineers and, uh, and water management specialists across the country, and we've been singing this from the treetops for a long time. And uh, obviously, my focus being the waste, uh, Benoit is, is more the water um, focus. But that brought together um, the public and the private sector to drive the development of this master plan, the water and sanitation master plan, to look at the different areas uh, across the country and the, the different um, stresses and strains. And I think Benoit has alluded to that already. So part of that master plan is looking at gearing up for the future. That includes um, uh, our infrastructure requirements. So we need to plan uh, from our catchment areas, looking at our catchment management agencies, uh, catchment management plans, uh, drive developments and systems in terms of our water storage. So we have a plan in terms of which uh, dams are, are going up uh, at what period of time, and the government has to plan and budget for those in advance. So we need to look at each of those also in terms of where that water is uh, and what that water is is destined for. So. It could be designed and destined for the mining sector, as Benoit alluded to before. It could be targeted at the agricultural sector, or it could be looking at, at our cities. So effectively, the master plan is put together to look at that structure and infrastructure, and, and we've got a good plan, and it really is trying to follow that plan. So we've got Benoit back. I've been filling in uh, for you, Benoit. I think load shedding zapped you as well. Um, so maybe you can continue from where you left off. We were talking about uh, you were at at, uh, at 41%, I think was the last thing we, you said before we lost you. Uh, thanks. Let's hope the internet holds up here. Um, <laughs> the yeah, So we've got 41% non-revenue water, 36%, 37% is actually leaks, which we can do something about. The rest is really administrative issues, billing issues, and a small amount of theft. So our first priority is to drive efficiencies in reducing our, our water losses. And um, that's major. So that's about 10 billion rand a year's worth of water, which is enough for a city like Durban or Cape Town um, in reality. So that's the first thing. The second thing is really to reuse. Again, we're in the waste hierarchy here. And that's to reuse. Um, so we reuse most of our water that comes out of Gauteng. It goes north and south watersheds. A lot of it's imported from uh, Lesotho and from KZN. So we move water all around and it is there's just not enough. So what do we have to start doing without compromising return flows? So what goes back in, which is mostly used by, um, let's say, Eskom and agriculture, we have to start reusing our sewage and we can increase um, our, let's say, available water by doing that. And the, the, there's two advantages in, well, three. One is we save water, two resources, I'll speak about that. And three, what we do is we sort out the pollution issue because the pollution that we have, which is a waste of resource into our water reserve, is in actual fact reducing the available water for potable industrial and agricultural use. Um, so we've got two wobblies there. We, we have less rainfall, so we have less water in our system and we're polluting our reserve, um, which increases the cost and that directly makes water unaffordable. So it's quite a vicious circle because it's circular. So it's all connected. Um, the other element is, apart from the water that's in sewage, is there's embedded energy. And generally speaking, in first world nations, you've got anywhere between 2 to 4% of a country's energy, electrical energy, is used for um, water production, conveyance, uh, pumping, and sewage treatment. Sewage treatment is very energy intensive. And um, so technology is improving and the likes, but we can we have enough energy within the system. And in the Scandinavian countries, they found excess, we can put back into the grid. So it, it's actually criminal to think that we are wasting resources through not treating our sewage properly. To me, what, what, what the winning point is here is that, and from a chamber perspective, it's one of our big drivers. You know, we're in business here. We're a business water chamber, and we believe we can reduce the cost of treating sewage and the cost of cleaning up our polluted environment by converting those into a circular approach, which is a resource conversion system. So chemicals, water, and energy. So there's no excuse to say that we can't afford, we don't have budget to treat our sewage. That's absolute, let's say, 
throwing governance out, out the window. So, um, but we have a collective centrally communist controlled philosophy that we have to modify. And we see people are starting to gravitate towards the center where um, these type of approaches decentralized, which local government is, we can start adopting very nice circular approaches that will actually add to GDP, give us water security, chemical security, and stop polluting the environment. So circular is, is really good in that context. The third thing the master plan speaks about, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, is um, desalination on the Now, like hydrogen and water, it's infinitely renewable. And I do not believe we, we are a water scarce nation in reality. If we, we think in, um, in, in old terms, we may well be, but if you look at the sea, there is so much water there. Yes, there's a bit of salt in it, but we have the technology. We're smart now. And I mean, we really are smart people. And as South Africans, and I'm proudly South African, not being xenophobic, I'm proudly South African, is we are the co-inventors of seawater reverse osmosis. And during the sanctions, we couldn't share ideas with NASA because of, 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 of the issues that we had. But we had to desalinate water in the 50s and 60s in our mining, in our diamond mining. So we understand desalination. Most of us ply our trade outside of, of South Africa because there's a lack of work at the moment, but it's coming back. And what you do is you, you take the water out of the salt and you put the salt back and the water eventually goes back after, after a period of time. Okay, So the, the net effect is zero. But there's a very smart thing. And the guys in Durban, despite some of the issues we hear about, the guys in Durban, I think it's your, your, your paddock there, Chris, is we have the remix system. It's a Japanese um, um, invention perfected in South Africa where we take treated sewage with seawater and what we do is we mix the two and the amount of water we get out is the same if we desalinate it, but the amount of water with salt with brine that goes back into the return into the sea is in actual fact uh, no different to what we took in. So it's a, it's a very simple mass balance, but the difference is we don't waste sewage, treated sewage, by putting it into the sea. And secondly, we lower the energy costs by reducing the osmotic pressure okay, that we need because now you've diluted the seawater with, um, with sewage water, which is potable conductivity. Um, what happens is you've got cheaper desalinated water. The only thing is you've got the yuck factor, but, you know, we're drinking dinosaur water, so we need to also raise awareness the likes and you know when we go to Vintuk, we don't complain about the yuck factor because you have no choice so the three big components of the master plan don't talk to dams we are dammed out okay we've, we've dammed mm. ourselves out 250 percent of our annual rainfall dam capacity so we, we we have to reduce reuse and reimagine um with with desalination and we have all the technologies there's no excuse what we don't have is political acceptance and will, but that is changing daily at the moment. And hence the chamber where we collaborate with government to, to, to get these things done. So in a nutshell, that's where it is. And I'm, I'm really passionate about it. Yeah, I'm going to just jump in here, Chris, if I may. Uh, uh, what, what we've heard from Ben Wilder is fascinating stuff. And I'd love to, I hope we have the opportunity to go into a little bit more detail. I want to just take a step back and just look at this idea of, of linear versus circular in this relation to water quickly. So we just bring it home to this conversation around circularity. I mean, so typically, uh, you know, if I was if I was doing a show or, a, or, a, or a, a conference on water, I might say, well, try to understand the flow. You know, really, it's about capture and storage. It's about transport. It's about treatment. And then there's consumption. And then generally at that point, there's waste. And so, and obviously there's a number of points along the way where we can start to understand circularity. And I guess the obvious way would be at the point of waste. Well, how do we now turn that around and bring that back to capture and storage? And that's some of the, the things that, uh, that Ben was been speaking about there. Uh, Chris, perhaps just, just with that context in mind and responding to, to what the, some of the key points that Ben was touched on, um, how do you see this? Uh, the, what are the what are the, what's the low hanging fruit in terms of bringing this the circular economy back into play here? 
There's a number of opportunities, and I think we've got to be really realistic. Uh, again, looking at what Benoit said, we've got some big problems. So, I mean, the little town in Maritzburg where I live, I think we're, we're looking at nearly 50% water losses. Um, I don't want to go into how much of that is stolen and how much of that is just poorly managed, but uh, yeah, those are issues that we need to we need to look at. But worldwide, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in New York or London or, or any of these massive metropolitan areas, um, all of the wastewater is treated and put back into the system. And there are economic opportunities around that. But we've also got to understand that um, the infrastructure side of things needs to be more forward thinking. And, and things like desalination, uh, there was always a, a big um, anti-movement against desalination because of brine issues and because of, of high power usage. The technology has advanced. We've moved on from there. You know, there, there's different ways we can look at that. And, and desal um, can be done at scales that, that start to make sense. Um, where we're not talking about you know, billions and billions of dollars. But we also need to look at the opportunities uh, in terms of, of, uh, of the other waste streams and, and the other nutrients. And, and I think we need to understand that, that there's also a lot of nutrients that we're losing. Uh, phosphates and nitrates that, that go through our wastewater that need to be harvested. Um, otherwise, they go straight into the system. We end up with eutrophication and algal blooms in our rivers, lagoons, and seas. Um, and that changes the biodiversity and the water quality right through the system. So we need to look at harvesting that. We can't throw away nutrients. Um, but at the same time, we then also need to understand um, applications and opportunities around the problems. Um, so we all probably heard that you know, there are issues like um, uh, pesticides and herbicides and, and antibiotics and things getting into, uh, into the flow. But there's a big one now called PFAS, and, and Benoit can probably elaborate on that, which is the per- and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances, which are what we call the forever chemicals. And there's a big issue there we need to try and, and resolve. So, Benoit, maybe if you can chat about the nutrients and, and, the, and, the, um, uh, and the problem chemicals. Yeah, sure, Chris. Um, firstly, the nutrients, we go to a lot of trouble to, to, to let's use a broad term, mine them. Um, f for various things, so let's say, you know, phosphates and um, carry it using a lot of energy uh, and the likes. So we need to recover those uh, on a decentralized basis at each switch plant. So we've got 870 odd, I think nearly 900 at the moment in South Africa. So each one is a potential phosphate mining, mining hub. If you look at the persistent chemicals in our system, the... the <laughs> They're increasing, and as our systems are more interconnected and, and uh, become more circular, especially in inland countries and regions, um, they tend to concentrate up. And the, the nice thing is that the advanced technology, we need to reuse that water to recover the nutrients and to recover energy, takes care through membranes, okay? So ultrafiltration and reverse osmosis with their various cutoffs will take care of those persistent issues. So we are able to do that. And typically what we do to protect the membranes is we, we oxidize um, the effluent before anyway. So through ozonation, through chlorination, which is becoming less and less popular through peroxide, but um, ozone is, is, is probably the most appropriate. And oxidation takes care of all of the persistent um, um, molecules we have. But then the membrane filtration that we start putting in anyway has a molecular cutoff that it can take care of all of those elements, including all the vi viruses and bacteria that we have. So between alt filtration being coarse and reverse osmosis being um, fine. The difficulty with reverse osmosis is the brine stream that we generate. And um, so Vintuk does not uh, use reverse osmosis and it's been... Uh, reusing its water, all of its sewage, into the potable water system since the 1960s. And there were no membranes then. It has ultrafiltration now. It has what we call a triple barrier system. But having said that, brine has always been a potential issue environmentally and also uh, cost-wise. Luckily, we have the brine economy kicking off now. So it's another little loop that comes into the circular economy. And the Middle East is leading with the Americans in that we can selectively mine the various salts. So to, to, to get those back in the economy, you have, you've got to separate the potassium chlorides and the sodium chlorides, the magnesium chlorides, the sulfates and the likes. And in AMD, we are the world leaders, acid mine drainage. We recover all of the salts 
99.9% of the water, it's the only reverse osmosis in the world that does that. We have that thinking and we do it. The issue is the brown economy is not developed enough. So the sulfate salts that we have from AMD, we are unable to sink into cement manufacture, uh, steel manufacture and the likes, but that will, that will change. And we're going to generate more of a salt or brine economy through flue gas desulfurization on the coal-fired power stations. Okay. So um, the, the technology is there. So we squeeze out in the brine stream, we start squeezing out more and more water and recover the, um, the various salts and elements. So technology is there. There's no problem. And the economics are, are starting to make sense with brine. So, um, and in South Africa, it's, we sometimes need a nudge. We need legislation to push it, but we cannot put brine into landfill anymore. So that nudge has is, is, is come in. What we need to now do is start, and sometimes you need government uh, incentives, like they did in Europe with the landfill um, uh, swap, where you put taxes in uh, to get incineration to make sense. We, we're going to need that in South Africa, but the big thing is we need compliance and enforcement. And we as citizens need to hold government accountable. So these, to me, it's not a technical problem. It's a society in general problem. Uh, so we can reuse everything and we can take care of all of the potential health implications of the PFAS and the likes. So um, technically, no issues. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the opportunity, obviously, we, we, you know, we, we know that we have the systems and the solutions in terms of desalination. We have it for acid mine drainage. We still have a massive problem with acid mine drainage. And, and, and again, that is um, bringing in policy and legislation, and regulation to make sure that we look after our resources and, and those need to be enforced. Um, you know, we tend to find that we, we go offshore and we start looking for international type technologies and we can do it all here locally. Um, as some of the world's leaders in terms of understanding um, water engineering and, and water circularity. But there's also other opportunities in terms of circularity, and, and, and that comes around to issues such as efficiency, um, but then also look in alternative methods. Uh, agriculture is a prime example. Agriculture is one of our biggest users uh, of water, as is mining uh, and energy. Uh, very few people understand that electricity production is a massive user of water. Um, and yet, if you look at, at solar versus coal application, that there's much less water usage required there. But then we also have restorative and regenerative agricultural practices to move away from large-scale monoculture into more intensive agriculture that is more water efficient. So there's a lot of ways we can unpack circularity with regards to, to the water cycle. Um, and, and there's probably many more that you know. I mean, you're, you're the, 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 the numzan in terms of understanding this side of things. Um, but are there any key issues that, that we need to look at that, from your perspective, would be the big wins in this country? So, to me, you know, the agricultural sector that you bring up is, is we think it's a big win. And I, it's a double-edged sword because they're using 62, 63% of the water. If you take our water losses out, they use 70%. The global average is 70%. Okay, the only nations who don't are nations who have um, very high, um, let's say, very high manufacturing capability and import food. So we're the only African nation that has, um, we export a third of our food production. It, it's really high. It's really good. But we're not using our water, as you say, very, very efficiently. And the farming or the agricultural sector, if you look at the whole, the whole food chain, the whole sector, it's not in investment mode at the moment really because of the threat of land expropriation and because of the pandemic what's happened is a lot of the food production has become quite stressed but what in in a lot of the conferences i've been involved with with the agricultural sector here is there are early adopters of technology so technology is not not the issue um really it's a matter of investor confidence that that we have to address and um so it's there's also the issue of um, genetically modified crops that reduce that reduce water consumption, for example. That's also a hot topic, but um, most things we have are genetically modified, including the virus. Um, so, you know, one has to think, you know, quite broadly. So, to me, we've got to be very careful if we target agriculture singly because of the volume they, they take. They also have the lowest GDP per cubic meter of water used uh, ratio. 
Uh, but that's in all countries because food is cheap. I know it doesn't sound right, but food yeah. is cheap. You know, and, and the problem is water is cheap. And um, I, I still think that water is, is, is in need of being regulated in South Africa. It isn't from a, a price perspective across its whole supply chain. We're on record on, on that. I think the low-hanging fruit is a governance issue. If we can just embark, and, and, and you know, it's, it's new, on, on the master plan that says, no dams, we need to reduce our water footprint in our cities. And that starts at utility level. It will percolate down through costs to household levels. So it's the only way, day zero, we saw that in Cape Town. It put the price up, the consumption comes down. You know, it's, it's, it's a global tool and it's a hard tool. I think that's the one. But in parallel to that, we have to commercialize all of our sewage plants in private sector participation, because triple P tends to be a bit of a swear word, private sector participation, where the skills and balance sheet of the private sector, we've got the trillions in the private sector, we just need bankable water projects, and we start doing that at utility scale. What will happen in time, it will go down to, let's say, um, decentralized smaller scale, whereby the technology is starting, the water sector is starting to become economical. So desalination, for example, below 50 million liters a day or 50 megaliters a day becomes relatively expensive because the balance of plant, your intake, uptake, your power supply and the likes um, has to be amortized over a big number. But if you have a look at um, sewage treatment, for example, we in South Africa are very good biological nutrient removal and all the likes with the world inventors. I mean, we forget how good we are, you know, but it's <laughs> we must have another show on how good we are with our innovations in water is a lot of those are making sense when you take out the logistics involved and the environmental implications in pumping sewage over a big network. So mm -hmm. new developments we're starting to see have their own systems. And it's not necessarily um, 3 million rand houses, housing estates. I'm talking between RDP up to 800,000, where there simply is no sewage infrastructure. The unicities can't take it. So we're starting to see decentralized miniaturized um, uh, technology, which is quite, quite effective. So that's a natural pr progression. But I think we've got to hit it big with the metros. Um, so Nelson Mandela Bay has got an issue in that it didn't prioritize water and wastewater circularity uh, through a whole lot of issues, as we know, they've had down there. Now, now, it's, now it's day zero impending, and they are forced to accelerate the reuse of the sewage, to, but they're now going to starve agriculture um, from the Kharib Dam to give it for potable water treatment, upgrading their Neutgedag works um, to provide more. So, so now we're going to attack food security, which we shouldn't be doing to try and keep the city alive. So there's a, there's a very fine balance. And what you've got to remember in water is government holds all the cards because water was nationalized in you know, 1998 with the Water Act. So mm -hmm. the water belongs to... To the people of South Africa, and the custodian is the Department of National Water Department of Water and Sanitation. So it's different to energy, it's different to waste. Okay. So that's why I say we have to collaborate and you know and work with, with government. And the big thing is to reform the municipal or local government thinking. National government is not going to be doing this work. The Cubans are not going to be doing this work. This work has to be done at local municipality level where we have the biggest governance issues. So we have to get stuck in, reduce, reduce, and reuse, and then start topping up with diesel and, and, and the likes. On AMD, very difficult. The volumes are small. The pollution risk is high. And most of it is from abandoned mines. So it means the fiscus has got to come in. That's not in the trillion rand. Huh? Just All a quick was. aside from my, uh, from my point of view. I've got one or two quotes coming in uh, from Facebook, in light quotes. Uh, they're highlighting the point that uh, you know, decreasing water quality is a consequence of, of, of growing pollution. You also have comments along the lines of the real water crisis is actually a failure of understanding. Um, and also some quotes just giving you a thumbs up on your, on your comments there, Benoit. Um, but just a quick uh, question, if I can ask Nawazi. Uh, Nawazi, is anything from your side that, uh, that you'd like to ask the panel at this point? Actually, I don't because I would have a question and then he'd answer it. So I was just like, okay. 
<laughs> no, no, absolutely. And, and, and I'd just like just one point from my side. So obviously, and, and I'm, I'm hearing exactly what you're saying there, Benoit, that really it's a, it's a government issue. The water ostensibly belongs to government. I mean, even water on private land belongs to government. Um, but, but in the process of trying to solve these problems, perhaps in parallel, perhaps in an effort to, to provide some leadership, is there something that the that big companies can do? Uh, we're talking about the. I mean, you, you mentioned acid mine drainage. That uh, is there stuff that the big mines can do on active mines to lead uh, some of the bigger industries, perhaps that can pick up the the types of technologies you're describing to really demonstrate that uh, we can do these things. To remind ourselves, perhaps that we can do them, and in fact, as you say, invented half of them. So to put into context. 60% of the water goes to agriculture, 30%, it's 28, but round numbers, 30% goes to our cities and towns and metros, 10% is industry, including Eskom Energy gener Generation and Sasol. So if you have a look at it, the amount of water used by industry is relatively small because we're not highly industrialized compared to, say, EU, USA. So the proportions are a little bit different. Having said that, Eskom is the lowest in the world in coal-fired water to kilowatt hour. I can't remember the number. We're the lowest. Our breweries are amongst the best in the world where we're something like one and a half, two liters per liter of beer produced. And that's generally speaking because we use ultrafiltration now in, 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 in beer manufacturing as opposed to Gizzelger type filtration with waste and, and the likes. So if you look generally speaking, if you do a mass balance in a paper bill, for example, in South Africa, they're all reusing their water, around about 50% of it. To go to the next level, water has to be 40, 50 rand a cubic meter for them to look at it. And at the moment, it's 20 to 30 rand. So the economics aren't driving it. The EU, what they said is you pay double the water rate, so 70, 80 rand a cubic meter for your effluent. And they started reusing, re reusing more. So I think there's a lack of confidence in industry at the moment to invest. And the economics don't make too much sense. The mining side has always reused its water. If you look at our gold mines, they've got a closed loop system. The problem is when you stop mining and your voids fill up, what happens is you decant. And if it stays long enough in the ground, it absorbs all of the um, impurities, the metals. You've got sulfate reducing bacteria, generates sulfuric acid, becomes acidic, and then it decants. So the, the problem is that we did not have enough provisions from mining operations in the last 100 years. The current mines are generally speaking, so the coal mines are treating the AMD as they mine. And the current mines can only get a closure certificate if they treat the acid mine drainage. So in the coal mines, generally speaking, but not completely, most are treating the, the, the AMD. The gold mines is very different because a lot are, are abandoned. So the AMD is a low hanging fruit if um, we had enough of a fiscus to put in the money. Now, the reality is that it's 20 rand a cubic meter to produce the water because it's complex. Um, and that's in coal. In gold, it'll be a bit more. The other problem we have in gold is we have uranium in there. And um, uranium is contaminating most of our AMD on the Western Basin. So what we've got to do is take care of the uranium also and there if you think toilet to tap is a yuck factor uranium is is a bit more difficult so we have that issue to address so what we're saying is that we need a thriving economy to put in the mix the amd and the amd you know is less than a thousand megaliters a day um all the gold and Joburg's using 1600 and i think Rainwater is producing 2,600 or 3,000 megaliters a day. So it's, it's, it's potentially harmful, but from a water volume perspective, we can blend the higher cost you know, into the lower cost water that we're getting. Rainwater sells at about 14 at the moment, 14 or 15. So um, yes, the, the, there's solutions. But the other thing is, you know, you've got all of these, you've got three tiers of government and you've got all of these, so, so local government reports to COCTA. Mm. DWS is the custodian and runs the bulk water with the water boards and the dams in the Sutu Highlands. Um, then you've got some municipalities who have their own water resources that they are permitted to use through the water use licenses. 
And you have the provinces and the catchment management agencies you're supposed to provide oversight and the like. It's complicated. Exactly. I think this is fascinating. As you said, we could probably have 14 different shows just on the water sector. Um, we're already eight minutes over our allocated time. So we, we have uh, way overdone it. Um, but I'd like to, to thank you again, uh, Benoit, always a pleasure, um, brilliant mind, great passion for the sector. Um, and uh, off to Gordon, just to close us out. Yes, indeed. And, uh, and, and for, thanks for that, Chris. And so that's all we have time for, folks. Uh, great conversation on water. As we can see, uh, I must tell you, it's a, it's a, it's a much more complex uh, uh, set of topics than than I, for my part, uh, uh, thought it was. And, and, and thanks very much for, for opening our eyes on that, to both to Benoit and to Chris. And, uh, and yeah, I think we should definitely, down the road, uh, start to zoom in on some of these specific solutions and issues and policy questions and maybe bring uh, onto the show uh, one or two uh, policy commentators who can give us some, some feedback on some of the points that uh, Benoit raised on, on the governmental side. But enough from me. Uh, thank you very much indeed to ben La, uh, ben, Benoit Leroy for, for joining us, our special guest from the SA Water Chamber. Good luck to you and the Chamber and the work that you're doing. Uh, may, may the floodgates open in terms of the work that's coming through to you guys and, and, and may we solve some of these problems and see some of these municipalities engaging you and your members and buying into the technologies that, uh, that you guys are, are able to deliver to solve these problems and make this... Uh, this, this increase the circularity uh, of the wa of water in, in the water sector for, for, for all of our benefits. Uh, thank you, as always, to Chris, and thank you to, to, uh, uh, to Nawazi. That's all for today, folks. Uh, we'll see you next week, same time, for a continuation of this interesting topic. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye for now. How do we grow this influence of of uh, black leaders, uh, men and women that can represent our industry inside the ANC, inside the, the policy-making structures. Get uh, to grips with the, the digital environment, uh, put together best practices, what works and what doesn't, very importantly. In the project that we're doing in Chatlaj, we've created a, a linking bridge between those, uh, those two little areas there. So it becomes a matter of just 10 minutes walk from one side to the other. So my message to our CEOs and those chief investment officers is where at the end of the day do you want to see your role? So by feeding all of our water back to a stage where we can bring it back into the process, we're in effect saving around about 35% of, uh, of our water usage on site.